Hi. I'm gonna try to talk about a lot of different things here and uh, I don't have any outlines, so forgive me if I'm rambling. I just read a lot of speeches from the Russian president's website. And the website is similar to the White House website. It's got perfect translations in English, uh, drop-down menus, a very similar design. And what was surprising to me was that st starting back in 2007, Putin was, Vladimir Putin was in favor of a strong United Nations in order to prevent what he, what he calls a unipolar world. And unipolar simply means one country dictates to other countries and creates, in the end, a kind of imperialism that destroys itself. And when you listen to Putin, he favors a few things consistently, several things consistently. One of them is stability, uh, predictability, and those are things that come up quite a bit, but also balance. So he oftentimes will say, this is nothing personal. You know, we understand that post-World War II, there are certain actions that have been taken and these actions simply require a balance in order to prevent a unipolar world, which runs contrary to the idea of international law and the United Nations. And when I'm reading this, and I, and I try to read political speeches by all the world leaders, and so far, because Putin has obviously been involved in the government for quite some time, the consistency and logic of his, of his ideas cannot be matched. Now, President Joseph Biden of the United States has also been a career politician. None of his speeches, at least not for the last five years, are noteworthy. And what's interesting about Putin is when, you know, he has a series of interviews with Oliver Stone and he's able to converse spontaneously about almost any topic. And the reason I, the reason I bring this up is because we want to talk about different systems post-World War II, different political systems post-World War II. And obviously, as, as Americans, we've been taught that a checks and balances system that limits executive power is preferable to a strong executive system. And we've pointed to the Soviet Union and its collapse in 1991 as one piece of evidence for our idea or argument. And it doesn't, it doesn't actually surprise me that the two most logical leaders in the world come from essentially failed states. Germany, which had Merkel, Angela Merkel, and Russia, which of course failed or collapsed in 1991. And you can also see that both Putin and Merkel believe that international overexpansion and military adventurism contributed to the decline of their countries. And that's another theme with Putin. He talks about, he's anti-nationalist in one sense, he's anti-extremist as well, but when he talks about nationalism, what, you're, what he's really referring to is a German kind of nationalism in the past where that nationalism creates a sense of superiority that then compels political leaders to back up their rhetoric by expanding or extending their influence overseas through not just political systems, but educational systems, economic systems, legal systems, and so on and so forth. And this is all really interesting because are we still in a world where 
it is feasible to believe that a strong executive system is superior to the checks and balances within a tripartite American system, or even a multi, an even more multifaceted system in Europe, which has far more than just two political parties, thereby forcing legislatures to compromise in order to get anything done. And there's quite a few approaches to, to evaluating all of this, but the first thing you want to think about is just the fact that Europe still has a strong executive in a sense, because typically parliament, whoever's in, whoever has the majority of parliament will be the one that essentially appoints either the chancellor or the president or the prime minister. And so you don't have this American system where you have a different political party in the legislature that is at loggerheads or opposed to the executive. In other words, they're working together in a sense, but they have to compromise, at least in a European system. That's obviously not the case in the American system, where in some cases, depending on who's in the White House, the legislature at the federal level will either stall or do whatever it takes to stymie the president's, the president's actions. In some cases, forcing the president to attempt to overextend his or her powers through executive orders. And then you have a third way where the legislature and the executive and the military and the police are all on the same page. Yes, there are minority parties. Uh, Putin pointed out that there are at least 30 or 40 different political parties in Russia now that are official, that have registered. And you get the sense, however, that these are, of course, minority parties. They can speak out against the executive, but at the end of the day, a lot of it might just, just be sound and fury. It's the same thing in Singapore. In Singapore, the ruling party, uh, the founding party, the PAP, allots a specific number of seats in the legislature for minority parties. And to, the, to their credit, they've expanded the number of those minority seats. But everyone knows that the PAP is in charge. That goes back to a history of a successful executive in Singapore under LKY. So there's a pattern here, and the pattern is if you have a strong executive like an LKY or a Putin that understands and is capable of, capable of understanding the entire government. And Putin, both Putin and LKY went to law school. So you've got obviously training there as well to be able to understand how the government works and how the legislature works. Not a coincidence. If you have a strong executive, it seems quite clear, especially during unstable times, whether it's post-British colonialism in Singapore or post-1991 in the Caucasus, seems fairly obvious that a strong executive is the system you want. You don't want lawyers mucking things up and trying to make it harder to receive capital, foreign, or capital or foreign direct investment or technology and so on and so forth. But what, what we should also consider, consider is that We should also consider this idea that really the success of some nations over others has been simply a choice of which side they picked in World War II. Who did they align themselves with? And if you're Singapore and you aligned yourself with uh, the United States, you chose, in retrospect, 
you chose wisely. You're doing very well economically. Um, it's just interesting that this one choice has really determined so much of where we are today and where we were going to go simply based on just a random act of being born in one place over another. And no politician really talks about this, right? This idea that so much of our lives and our educational system and our cultural values come from a war that people of this generation have nothing to do with. And as a result, has led to a lot of outdated political institutions attempting to continue to assert influence based on the past when other methods could be superior and other political institutions could be superior. On this point, Putin believes that NATO is essentially outdated in order to have true global security. You have to have a security, security alliance That includes not just people in NATO, but also China, India, Pakistan, and so on and so forth. And by not having, obviously, Russia as well, and by not allowing either the inclusion of Russia within NATO or a system where you have all the players necessary to have to achieve true global security, all you're doing is splitting up the world again. And this is in fact what's happening now. You're, you're looking at a, a block being formed again in the East. What was NATO designed to do? It was designed to create a Western bloc and protect a Western bloc against an Eastern Bloc. Well, that Eastern Bloc doesn't exist anymore, really. After the Soviet Union collapsed, it really isn't a quote-unquote Eastern Bloc. And that's another point that Putin makes. But what's happening now is a new Eastern Bloc is being formed with all the nations that have been excluded from NATO, which includes Russia, Pakistan, Iran, and a lot of other countries in between, probably Tajikistan. And that's a lot of land, by the way. China, obviously. It's a lot of land when you put all those countries together, especially if you include, say, Kazakhstan, and so on and so forth. So, what Putin is alleging is really a total failure of diplomacy due to its desire to maintain structures that no longer make sense. And as a result, no longer provide truly global security. Now, another one of Putin's themes is that Russia is not going to match the United States defensively tit for tat. It's not going to spend as much as, as the United States will on defense. In fact, Putin at one point mentions that Russia only spends about 10% on defense as the United States. And he doesn't say this next part, but the reason he's able to do that is because he has pursued a path of asymmetric innovation. So I'm, I suspect by 2007 and even earlier that Russia was perfecting drone technology because of its concern over the anti-ballistic missile systems being placed around its borders. And of course, you can create a missile defense shield. Um, you can do all kinds of things to try to prevent missiles with nuclear warheads from reaching your borders. That's obviously going to be extremely expensive. It just, theoretically, it just makes 
sense that a much cheaper alternative would simply be to have smaller and automatic AI driven response that sends in say 10,000 drones once your AI program suspects or has on its target list incoming missiles of any kind. That's obviously much cheaper than trying to <laughs> build a defense system against a nuclear warhead coming into your territory when the quote-unquote opposition has placed missiles right next to you, right on your borders. And so a lot of what we talk about in terms of war A lot of the assumptions we make, such as mutually assured destruction, a lot of them still apply, but just in totally different ways. If you look at the movies, at one point Oliver Stone shows Putin a, uh, the movie of Dr. Strangelove. And you know, it's, a lot of it still applies. You know, you have this idea of a doomsday machine. That's actually a real thing that was being developed. Um, but what you get here is that the post-World War II structures led some countries to overspend on the military. And as a result, given technology, technological advances, have put those countries with bloated military budgets at a disadvantage politically compared to other countries that have a more sustainable defense budget, which have chosen the path of asymmetrical defense and therefore asymmetrical warfare. And this is, this is not entirely new, right? There's always been this idea that a, a couple of million dollars can get you RPGs that, will be, that are capable of knocking down a 20 million or 100 million or 200 million dollar plane, fighter jet of some sort depending on, again, whether or not you're able to perfect the software and the AI and so on and so forth. So the theme here is not only that a strong executive model politically can succeed if you have a bright executive, it's also that most of the successful systems including of any kind, have decided to avoid a bloated military budget because they can. For the first time, they're able to counter a quote-unquote more advanced country through asymmetrical defenses. That might be the game changer in the switch from a political system of checks and balances into an executive-led system to the extent that you have an executive that is able to harness asymmetrical technology that allows his or her country to avoid a bloated military budget. And that's exactly what Putin has done. Putin has reduced poverty in Russia by two-thirds. And it's not a coincidence that Russia spends only 10% of America's military budget and was able to do that. China has also created the largest middle class in modern history. And again, obviously, has avoided both military adventurism since 1950 and a bloated military budget. So that's one way of looking at the system here, of the changes post-World War II, where asymmetrical warfare has now become so cost-effective that it allows countries in opposition to anyone attempting a, to impose a unipolar world, it allows countries to unite against that single imperialistic country 
or allegedly imperialistic country in a manner that is both cost-effective and sustainable, assuming you're able to make the necessary investments. And of course, create the necessary talent. It's a bit, a lot to take in. We're just sort of realizing that, you know, it, it's just in a situation where if you're living in a country like the United States, where so much of the economy does revolve around an unaccountable military budget that, and the fact that we've just had a strong executive attempting to reverse that, who failed to do so. You're, if you're in my shoes, it's hard not to predict inevitable decline within my lifetime here in the United States, given what I just said. Because once, and this is what Eisenhower warned us against, obviously the military industrial complex, and here we are. And of course, the United States just left Afghanistan, it's 2021 in August, and it's quite obvious that despite spending $2 trillion already on Afghanistan, Iraq, and so on, perhaps also Syria, since 2001, with another projected four plus trillion dollars in costs that will be coming due, both based on debt, uh, veteran healthcare costs, and so on, it's fairly obvious that we haven't achieved anything remotely close to what Eisenhower and Marshall achieved in both Japan and Germany post-World War II. When you put all that together, just, well, again, it tells you that a strong military, especially one that, has, that is bloated, isn't worth much. It will be able to create jobs, but at the end of the day, it doesn't actually provide security. What actually provides security is reduction in poverty, economic stability, and perhaps international law, or at least some form of diplomacy. So we talked about that. Now we talked about this idea of Russia and other nations that have not aligned themselves with the United States or with NATO, forging their own way. And remember that the whole point of, how, of investing in people of of all, all of what we do is designed to maximize human potential. It's designed to, to be able to say that a child born here will have the same opportunities as a child born there. Whether it's 500 miles from where I am or 10,000 miles from where I am. And we do that not because we want to create the best scientists, although that's obviously part of it, not because we want to create the best athletes, although that's obviously part of it. We do it to provide a stable foundation for personal relationships that can then be leveraged into an understanding of each other that can then lead to peace, or at least a stable and predictable system both economically and otherwise, that avoids war. And clearly, we haven't done that. And clearly, our failures have caused a split in the entire world in a way that seems to revert to the divisions that we had right after World War II. In other words, we seem to be going backwards. But that's not the case with other countries that are not aligned. So we talked about, they seem to be coming together. There was a summit, I believe, that happened in Tajikistan fairly recently. And this also goes back to the principle that there are always more outsiders than there are insiders. And if the outsiders simply bond together, 
they will at some point be able to overwhelm or at least outclass the insiders. And so there's always been this battle between the insiders trying to buy off opposition or trying to make friends, but not in a way that's truly inclusive and that allows the outsiders to bond together, but not necessarily in any cohesive way. In other words, that bonding together by the outsiders is typically, typically in opposition to the insiders and therefore it doesn't lead to a sustainable, consistent philosophy. Now, we talked about the strong executive. Let's, let's talk about that. Yugoslavia under Tito is an example of a non-aligned strong executive. Tito, T-I-T-O. And what's interesting about Yugoslavia is that, of course, Tito was influenced by the Soviets. His economic stability was influenced by the Soviet system, but he was also non-aligned and consequently was able to create his own kind of economic system in a sense. Now, the problem with Tito, who might, might be one of the, the best examples of a strong executive in the 21st century, is that when he died, within 10 years, Yugoslavia was in chaos. So he's probably, he was probably in power, I'm guessing, for about 40, 50 years. 10 years after he died, Yugoslavia was in chaos. So that goes back to one reason why the strong executive model has been, has, has, a, has a share of skeptics. Because even if it's successful, even if you do manage to have an LKY or a Putin, chances are, or a Ma, or, no, or a uh, Xiaoping, even if you manage to get these kinds of leaders, when these leaders die, the battle to replace them can create chaos. Let's talk about why that happens. Singapore is obviously a different example. It's a small country. It can prevent the legal system or the lawyers from outclassing the executive branch simply by recruiting all the brightest minds out of law school or anywhere really, the military and so on. And that's precisely what Singapore has done. Obviously LKY was educated as, as a lawyer in the UK, but of course he became an executive. Now, within 10 years, Yugoslavia essentially collapses, goes into war. Why? Because in a large geographic area, a large landmass, when you have a strong executive, that executive has to rely on his outposts or her outposts for information. And if you look at what happened to this happened to the Soviet Union, bad news was not welcomed. The philosophy or the motif of kill the messenger has always been in play. And if you have 99 different cities or hubs and only say one of them is giving you bad news, chances are, <laughs> even if that bad news is legitimate, chances are that that messenger is going to be replaced and people are gonna fall in line. one way or another. And the reason for that is to maintain the stability of that local government. Nobody wants to be replaced. People that report good news maintain their budgets. They have less interference from outsiders, or in this case, insiders in the capital. And whether it's a serial killer that's on the loose or something else, and this actually happened in Russia, by the way, sorry, the Soviet Union, bad news, affects your credibility with the capital, within a strong executive model. And that affects the funding, that affects all the different relationships on a local level. 
because of the dependence of the executive on all the different branches all over the country. This is not a problem in a smaller country because the executive can simply take a walk and figure out whether or not, or look at statistics and data and figure out whether or not those numbers are being gamed or whether he or she is being lied to. You can't do that in a country as big as Russia. You can only imagine how difficult it would be in an even bigger geographic area under the Soviet Union. Especially when not everyone speaks the same language in the Soviet Union. That makes it even more difficult. So there's always this tendency to cover up bad news. And this of course extends into, if it's a strong executive model, extends into journalism, right? It extends into, it creates essentially a form of censorship. Because the executive, in Mo whether it's in Moscow or another place, wants to hear that things are going well and rewards people for good news. Bad news almost never gets rewarded. So that's the weakness within the executive, strong executive model over a large geographic area. It's not only that bad news is essentially hidden or has an incentive to be hidden, you know, it's also just the fact that the executive is really useless outside of his or her capital. And you end up with what I discussed earlier with having a potentially a potential political Frankenstein, right? You've got 14 different doctors working on 14 different areas of the body, but only perhaps, you know, if, if even one of them is not competent, that will obviously, the patient will die. And the doctor who's incompetent is going to do everything he or she can to cover up deficiencies. That is also perhaps one reason why journalists get killed. You also have a lot of atrocities. You have accounting deficiencies. It happens in corporations as well, right? That's where you have accounting shenanigans that eventually lead to bankruptcy or an investigation by a national government. The same principles apply with countries and, and multinational corporations. There's always this incentive to cut corners. And so the real argument against a strong executive system is not only succession problems, but also this very human tendency to kill the messenger. And as well as just physical limitations, you can't have the capital, somebody in the capital flying out to 99 different cities on a regular basis. And so you get the sense overall that regardless of whatever system is in, is in effect, you have to have reliable data in order to create a stable and predictable system. And it's become, and here's the question, it's now become easier to get that data, but only if everyone's on the same technological standard. I've talked about this before. One of the reasons why China has been so successful is because it has enforced a single technological standard. It doesn't have to deal with, say, a national standard, a state standard, or a provincial standard, and then a local standard. Within the United States, there are different software systems for each, for, yeah, for each branch. Uh, let's take the court system. Within a mile from each other, there's a national court and, and a state court. Well, actually, it's not a state court, it's a local court. Of course, uh, I mean, they're essentially county one. And the reason, by the way, is again, to prevent corruption, right? So if you uh, have the more, or to try to, pre to prevent corruption under the idea that if you have an, a, the same executive, the same political party, there's a, there is that incentive to not only cover things up in order to maintain credibility, but also <laughs> just to pay people off. Right, in order to make sure that things stay hidden. And it's a, a lot easier to do that when you're all on the same, well, in the same building or the same branch. It's more difficult to do that when you're competing for funding and so on and so forth. 
And so that's also the problem with the executive model over a large geographic area, is that money can probably buy silence. Money can oftentimes cover things up for the, in the short term. And that prevents the strong executive from fixing fundamental problems until, until after it's too late. So, we were discussing the court system. So within the court system, you have a national system that's got its own technological standard. It's, called, it's a different system, it's called PACER. It's run by a different company or a different agency within the, within the county. There's another system that wasn't even online until fairly recently. So in other words, the federal system has been an online system probably for, gosh, at least 20 years. And so they were, they were, they were ahead and still are than the local system, which only recently went online. Uh, different systems locally have gone online at different times within the same state. So I, th I believe in California, Riverside, which is about six, seven hours south by car, is just now entering uh, documents being filed online. Where I'm at right now, they've been doing that for a few years now, but the system is not a very good system. It's quite obvious that it's got flaws. And so if this continues, you're going to have one within one state, even though it's got the same political party, essentially on a de facto basis, you're going to have completely different technological standards that make an audit and therefore data difficult. That's not a problem in Russia and it's not a problem in China. And so the other thing we have to think about is not only asymmetrical warfare and defense, but also cybersecurity costs. One thing I've been bouncing around in my head is this idea that the more expensive cybersecurity becomes, the greater the chances of both fascism and a welfare state. They seem contradictory, right? One seems to be, you know, from a different political school, that is typically opposed by another, but they're both extremes. See, that's, that's the point, right? When you have political problems, extremism becomes more viable. And if we have a political system that makes it difficult to audit, even within the same state, and makes it difficult for the executive, even within the same state, to get reliable data, you again have a communication deficiency. That in the absence, absence of truly honest politicians will eventually lead into all of the human nature issues that I've just discussed. And so, this has all been a roundabout way of trying to figure out whether or not technology and the costs of technology have changed the game, the political systems all over the world. And we know, again, I talked about how simply choosing the right allies in, in a war, and, you know, before most of us were born, dictated efficiency and data and so on. Well, Yugoslavia was, again, I didn't finish this point, was essentially not aligned. Well, it was the other countries that were not aligned were Nasser's Egypt, Sukarno's Indonesia, and of course, Yugoslavia. Um, today, I'm trying to think of some other countries that were not aligned, though obviously were quite a few in Africa. But today, only Indonesia, among all those non-aligned countries, is a place where you would probably want to live, if given a chance to live in a country that was aligned with a greater security structure and a greater security apparatus. And that seems a bit odd. Uh, Indonesia, by the way, is blessed with natural resources, a young population. Um, it's got all kinds of natural resources, right? It's almost impossible to fail, <laughs> uh, simply given the natural wealth, um, as well as all the ports, 
as, and so on and so forth. And remember that this is an, a paradox. The less sovereignty that a non-superpower country has, has had post-World War II, in a sense, the better off they've been. Why? Because of that technology transfer. If you aligned yourself, or if you tried to come up with your own technological standard, you couldn't really export it without aligning yourself with a bigger power. This phone that I'm holding in my hand is a national security apparatus. It collects data. If you are a non-aligned non country, you may be able to make your own phone, but you can't export it so it doesn't result in data coming back to you. And that, of course, affects your ability to succeed, succeed politically compared to a country that has the ability to put this phone in, in the hands of anyone all over the world. So there's a paradox that the less independence a country has had post-World War II, the less sovereignty the country has had, in some cases, not all, that country has been better off, oddly enough. But it's not quite well, as, much of a, as much of a paradox when you realize how expensive cybersecurity is, how expensive it is to develop a technological standard that is both reliable and capable of giving you access to data that can then assist your intelligence apparatus. So once you include the cybersecurity, the costs of not only cybersecurity, in other words, of defending a technological standard that is reliable, you start to see all the pieces coming together. You start to see that the system we have in place will most likely favor not only countries that are capable of creating a universally accepted technological standard, but also countries that are able to maintain that standard in a sustainable way. And if the United States is spending 10 times more on its military than a country capable of engaging in mutually assured destruction, that's not sustainable. And so all of this goes back into this danger of fascism because to the extent that countries are unable to hire contractors or to create technology on their own through their own governments or through their own government aligned agencies, you have this idea that you're probably gonna at some point hire a multinational corporation who has that technology that you need. And that's where it gets interesting because in many cases, a multinational corporation will require terms and conditions, both legally and otherwise, in order to transfer that technology to you. And if you're a country that's caught, especially post-World War II, especially say in Africa, which is less developed, or has been less developed than other countries in terms of infrastructure, because of colonization, the short-term thinking, there's a sense that technology and the costs of maintaining a reliable technological standard have trumped sovereignty. And remember that the point of the United Nations was in fact to enhance sovereignty of smaller nations, especially, and to avoid a unipolar world. But we have that now. We have a multipolar world. But it's not necessarily a world with, with more sovereignty. Putin, in the interviews with Oliver Stone, says that really only a handful of countries have sovereignty, true sovereignty, today. He's right. So we seem to be going backwards into this idea of non-aligned nations. But this time, the non-aligned nations have the benefit of history. And 
of technology. And if they can manage that technology in a way that protects themselves in an asymmetric way, it's difficult to see how a country like the United States is going to achieve the same kind of success that it achieved from 1945 until 1991 and thereafter.